Okay. Uh, so, um, let me see, actually, let me instead share just this application. Not quite sure why I cannot see to share PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, can somebody give me a thumbs up to tell me that you guys can see it? All right. Okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to give a, a talk today, uh, which is going to be, you know, as befits the title, uh, a bit heterogeneous. Uh, but I think it's a very important aspect uh, of, uh, of 5G. Um, and so what I'm going to do is start out with, uh, um, with some generalities about 5G uh, and then move on to a couple of um, a couple of um, uh, enabling technologies uh, for heterogeneity. All right, so, um, you know, when we think about 5G or the evolution, you know, to 6G and the beyond, uh, what, we th what I think of is, you know, not a set of standalone systems, uh, but really an architectural evolution. Uh, and that evolution starts out, you know, roughly like this with, um, you know, some uh, uh, some access points uh, at the edge with some backhaul link, maybe wireless uh, lately, but more often wired. Uh, you know, maybe if you have uh, nano cells or small cells, in this case, it's uh, actually linked to um, directly to a lamppost, uh, a router, and then, you know, origin content in different places, often uh, with some uh, uh, with, with some mirroring and so on, and of course uh, D two D links, uh, for instance, using uh, using Bluetooth. Um, so you know, as this becomes more and more complicated, what you have is you have storage actually, which becomes distributed, and we'll talk about that later in the in the in the, in the lecture, uh, which becomes distributed, gets closer and closer to the edge. And what I mean by storage is not just traditional storage. So, for instance, server websites, uh, not just cache, but you know, extreme edge caching, and even peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems, in effect, using available storage from users in a peer-to-peer -peer system, like for instance, in peer-assisted uh, content delivery networks. And then, you know, the evolution gets even more complicated. Uh, how does it get more complicated? Well, you know, it's basically the cloudification and in fact, also the softwareization uh, of the network, which I'll talk about more. Uh, and in particular, not just having communications, not just having um, um, storage, but also having computing very much in there. And what do I mean by computing is any sort of application where you're not just downloading static content, you're not say just downloading a, a film, uh, but anything such as gaming or all of the applications that require interaction, particularly low latency interaction. Uh, so all of those then become uh, extremely meshed together, really blended. Um, and so it's this evolution really from the communication network to maybe a communication and storage network, to a communication storage and and, uh, uh, and computation network, in effect, a network for service and a softwareized network. So, um, what is five G? I get asked often. So, I think formally, it's a set of standardized technologies that are part of the technical tradition center around cellular telephony. Uh, 3GPP is the body that's most often associated with 5G, um, even though, you know, in many ways, uh, the formal side of standardization it goes through ITU, it's really 3GPP. Um, but informally, I think it's a suite of enabling technologies for uh, ubiquitous communications. Um, to one extent, that suite of technologies will be part of that formal definition, and to what extent that suite of technologies is actually going to evolve in conjunction, but maybe really over, overtaking 
um, these sort of more old fashioned traditional approaches uh, of 3GPP, I think, I think it's really to be determined. Uh, and I think the, you know, the, the jury is still out and I look forward to your questions later um, to, to have that discussion. So what is different uh, in this generation and I think in the future generations? So right now we operate really in a jumble of different networks. We have 4G or initial 5G, we can argue to what, to what extent it's 5G or not. We have consumer Wi-Fi, a huge, huge part of our traffic is consumer Wi-Fi. I'm talking to you via Wi-Fi. And in fact, during this COVID-induced um, uh, uh, quarantine, we have become extremely reliant on Wi-Fi. Um, and as you know, there's a variety of different speeds, settings, and policies. And that standardization is actually done by a completely different body from 3GPP. Uh, enterprise networks, whether it be high-end Wi-Fi and related technologies, uh, a lot of emphasis there on security and access policies. And then we have specialized networks, robotics, AR, VR, very low delay, industrial networks, uh, and then IoT sensors, which also operate with, uh, you know, body air networks operate with uh, standardization, usually through IEEE, uh, but they're again in a very, um, very diverse, very heterogeneous uh, setting. And then we have also V2X emerging standards, uh, which I think are, um, you know, some of the more exciting, I'll talk about that a little later, uh, but certainly necessary for all uh, transportation and vehicular um, networking. Okay, so let's go back to this evolution. And what I'd like to do is just maybe zoom in on a couple of these, uh, a couple of these uh, aspects of heterogeneity and, and talk about them. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, you know, when I mentioned 5G, one of the interesting things, if you look at well, the latest release, is that the from 3GPP is that it actually allows non-standard communications in the standard. So basically, that is an acknowledgement that Wi-Fi is is here to stay. Um, uh, I heard, uh, you know, a, a, a colleague whom I esteem, who's very experienced, for whom I have a lot of esteem, say that, you know, the region, the reason 4G came about was because WiMAX was the um, was the uh, uh, the threat, and the region 5G is coming about is because Wi-Fi is the threat. I think the difference is that, you know, Wi-Fi is here to stay, uh, and indeed, much of the traffic that is currently called 4G, for instance, that's coming, you know, through through my phone, uh, is actually being carried by Wi-Fi. Um, and you see even uh, very traditional cellular uh, networking companies uh, urging their, their, um, uh, their um, uh, customers to turn to Wi-Fi. You know, I have Verizon, which is a very traditional company, and they, they send me messages telling me to, to do my phone calls over Wi-Fi uh, whenever possible. Okay, so let's look at this, where we have these wireless links. The red link here is, say, a, a traditional cellular communications link, say, for, for 4G, and then I have a Wi-Fi link. So, for instance, my phone right here uh, is going to have uh, is going to have two links, uh, as it does right now, and it's going to have a link to uh, uh, to the base station, and it has a link to my private Wi-Fi. So, how do we manage this? Uh, and why is it challenging? It's certainly not challenging from the point of view of the hardware. My, my phone has the hardware. It has the it has the link uh, to to both, and it can receive from both. It doesn't have to switch back and forth between the two. They're two separate pieces of um, of hardware inside my phone, and of course, they're two different pieces of equipment outside my phone. Um, well, let me look. For instance, I have in the media file. It's separate. It's made into blocks. Those blocks are then further subdivided. Uh, into packets for transmission, say uh, internet uh, protocol packets, IP packets. And, you know, suppose that for the sake of argument, uh, I have the same amount, uh, the same amount of bandwidth uh, available on, uh, on my uh, 4G, say LTE system and my Wi-Fi uh, connection. Something that would seem sensible is maybe to just divvy up the packets into two. And so, um, you know, maybe send here the odd packets on the LTE, uh, 4G, send the even packets on the Wi-Fi. The problem that happens is suppose that the Wi-Fi uh, is interrupted because for whatever reason there's uh, interference. 
or it just it just goes down um, for for a little bit. Well, what will happen is that then I will only get the odd packets. So it basically what I have here is an insufficient amount of data, uh, and the splitting didn't go up. So what some uh, systems do is they will actually repeat. Uh, the, the, they call it striping, kind of like, you know, to akin to striping in uh, in um, uh, in storage networks, but it's not really striping, it's actually just a repetition code. The problem here is suppose that, uh, you know, when, when both are going, I'm really wasting resources because I'm getting packet once, twice, packet two, twice, and so on. But moreover, I uh, suppose that the second packet gets lost on both communications, I got to copy to packet one. Uh, but that doesn't do me any good because I'm still missing packet two. So how do we deal with this? Well, we do this with uh, uh, generally with coding. Coding is how we take advantage of the fact that data is not just packets that are being transported, like say uh, goods in a, in, a, in a transportation network, but then in communications, we have algebraic uh, data that we're transporting. And this, this evolution of codes here, which is, you know, a, 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 um, a snapshot of, of evolution of codes, uh, sort of, uh, and, and we'll revisit this later, go from, say, blob codes, traditional read solvent codes, which are, of course, very much in use right now, uh, to, you know, more advanced algebraic codes, such as convolutional codes, what we call, what people often call modern codes, uh, even though low density parity check codes, which were discovered by uh, Gallagher um, in the 1960s, in his um, Gallagher was my actually my doctoral advisor. Uh, in his uh, in his doctoral thesis, were sort of rediscovered in the 90s. Turbo codes came up in the 90s. Uh, the 90s also weightless codes, which keep sending until um, until. Um, exception happens uh, came about, still end-to-end -end codes. In the 2000s, network codes came about, and I'm going to talk to you particularly about random linear network codes, which are the, the only um, practical implementation of these codes. Um, and then um, I'm not really going to talk too much about compression. I'm happy to talk a little bit more uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, and then polar codes that many of you may have heard, but uh, all of these codes uh, are end-to-end -end codes except for network codes that are actually meant for networks. Um, so the strands of network coding uh, that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, what, is, what is it? Um, so remember how I had my media file and I chopped it up into packets. So I can think of the packets as chopping up uh, something into pieces. And this is, say, over here, the green piece is packet one, the red piece is packet two, packet three is the blue piece, and so on and so forth. So remember that the problem that I had when I was trying to reconstitute the file was that I might have two copies of packet one, but a missing copy of packet two. And having two copies of packet one didn't make up for not having that piece of packet two. What happens in RLNC is you're creating mixtures from these pieces. Now I'm showing the mixtures here in sort of a, a, a cartoon version. It looks like a quilt. Really, these are not sharding mixtures. They're not like I'm taking a little bit of green and a little bit of red. These are actual algebraic mixtures. I'm taking uh, sums with random coefficients. But this is just a convenient way of visualizing it. Now, what will happen is if I have, in this case, five pieces, so consider them as being five unknowns, I just need five independent equations, so five of these mixtures, uh, in order to be able to reconstitute uh, these five original pieces. But any five equations that are independent will do to reconstitute the original five pieces. So if I have k of these, any k mixtures will do. And each of these is what's called a degree of freedom. And in fact, one equation that gets me one step further, one step closer to being able to solve my equations. Now, I want to share this. This is very exciting. When I say this is fresh off the presses, this is announcement that came uh, literally this morning. Uh, so, uh, you know, you guys are the first to hear it. Uh, this is actually being used right now uh, by Barracuda Networks uh, in their uh, software-defined what area network products in the cloud networks, the cloud gen firewall. Uh, and it uses uh, it uses uh, software uh, using RLNC from, from Steinwolf, which is a, a Danish company that I co-founded to, um, uh, to do the tech transfer uh, for RLNC. Um, so 
why is the networking important? So remember when I saw, why is the network coding important? So remember when I explained to you this, this evolution and all of this heterogeneity of, of different, um, different types of networks. So some systems uh, are really more intent on throughput, but some systems, particularly some of the applications are really more intent on delay. Uh, so right now, for instance, uh, I'm talking to you and if my video gets interrupted, you know, that's a real problem. If somebody gave me a lot of throughput for some amount of time, but then, you know, no throughput later, the average throughput uh, might be very high. But what I really need is enough throughput to satisfy my demand. But also, most importantly, I need timely delivery. So this is kind of the real time streaming. If all I care about is having a huge file and the final time until that huge file finishes, is that's when I might use the kind of weightless codes that I mentioned before, the kinds of uh, the, like the Qualcomm Raptor codes. So one of the things I want to make clear is delay is not latency, by the way. Latency is data in flight. I can have low latency, high throughput, uh, and I can have the same delay and just bump up the, bump up the, uh, the bandwidth and have higher latency. Uh, delay is application dependent. And delay is not the inverse of throughput. Now this may be a bit uh, a bit counterintuitive, but it's very important. I can have high throughput with long delays, like I said. Uh, you know, the way I like to, to, to do the comparison is suppose that uh, I have a meal delivery um, uh, uh, pro um, uh, program and, you know, I, I've paid to have my meal, you know, to have some amount of groceries delivered every week. Uh, if, uh, if you don't deliver, you know, 52 weeks worth of groceries, then of course I won't be happy. I won't have enough throughput. Uh, but suppose that, you know, you, do, you deliver a hundred weeks worth of groceries, but only at the end of the year, I'll have gone hungry <coughs> Pardon me, for the entire year. And that's also not good. Um, so maybe you gave me a higher throughput. You gave me 100 weeks worth of food rather than 52 weeks, but that's not sufficient. So I need enough throughput, but I don't just need the throughput. I also need the throughput at the right time. I need it at the right time in the right order. So why is this challenging? Uh, so if I use this, uh, remember the, the, the problems that I had, if I split up the traffic or if I duplicated the traffic, now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to call those, uh, those patchworks as just being all brown. I'm really just mixing all the colors together in the RLMC picture that I showed you. And so now what happens is I have these equations and all the equations are useful. And so if I have a loss on one side, like I did here, say the second packet, basically all the different coded packets are making up for each other. So let me give you some idea of what this looks like in heterogeneous networks. Uh, this is uh, some joint work uh, that we've been doing at MIT with, with Intel uh, and which actually uh, is, um, uh, is uh, is being presented at, uh, is is being presented this week at ICC. Um, this is uh, RLNC uh, in a very heterogeneous system. Um, so you can see here are the different uh, um, access points. Uh, you can see a very rich topology. Uh, and this is comparing uh, RLN, coded RLNC with different round trip times uh, and comparing it with ARQ. ARQ is a system where um, a lost packet is repeated uh, through a system of acknowledgements. Uh, it's sort of the workhorse of uh, uh, wireless protocols at low level, lower layers. Um, you know, at uh, layers in, in Wi-Fi and also at higher protocol layers uh, in uh, protocols, transport protocols such as TCP IP. So what you can see is that the throughput increases with um, even in, in a point-to-point -point system. Uh, the mean delay also is improved and the max delay also is improved. And the max delay, the, the mean delay is uh, in effect the the inverse of the throughput, the max delay is really what I care about for that timely just uh, de delivery, for instance, for streaming applications. Uh, so what happens when I have a mesh? Well, when I have a mesh, uh, this effect of the coding actually is even more marked. Um, so I have a mesh here with a, a sender, a receiver, uh, and I have here a heterogeneous networking 
uh, between hops in the mesh. And what are we going to use here is uh, network coding, uh, which random network coding, by the way, one of the reasons why it's, it's so powerful, other than the fact that it allows this uh, throughput delay trade-off uh, to be fully functional as opposed to uh, old-fashioned end-to-end traditional codes like uh, like weightless codes, like, uh, pen, uh, like fountain codes, is that it allows the recoding. So I don't need to decode at these intermediate nodes. I can just remember how I was taking these, uh, let me take you back here. See what happens here is uh, I can mix these two together and I still get a mixture. I can mix these two together, I can still get a mixture. So I can keep mixing indefinitely uh, these coded um, packets and obtain new valid coded packets without ever having to do an intermediate decoding. Uh, so let me uh, step through, sorry, let me just do a quick time check. Uh, let me uh, step through these um, uh, these uh, graphs right here and tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, so what I'm doing here along the X and Y axis is I'm varying epsilon one, epsilon two, so the, the loss probabilities and I'm keeping the other loss probabilities um, uh, the same. Now, note that these are pretty high loss probabilities. So if I were going to do a routing scheme, uh, even with end-to-end -end coding, my throughput would be really, really bad. Um, let me give you an example here. I would have, I would say I picked the best one here and it's 0.2. So I have 0.2 probability of getting, uh, of getting a packet loss. So this is 0.8 probability of getting through. Here the best here the best would be uh, a 0.4 probably of getting through, so I have 0.8 times, uh, uh, 0.6 probably of getting through, 0.8 times 0.6. Here the best probably would be 0.7. You're already getting a very low probability of getting through end-to-end, -end, uh, which is why an end-to-end -end, uh, coding doesn't do so well. If instead uh, I do the mixing that I mentioned uh, earlier, at the intermediate nodes, you see that I get very close actually to the theoretical capacity of the system. Uh, it's much better uh, than if I just do the coding end to end. This is coding with RLNC, so it's still better. It's still better than with traditional uh, rateless codes. Uh, and if I do ARQ, uh, whether I do end to end ARQ or even uh, link by link, I have a much much lower throughput. Um, here is the, the, the average delay, uh, the one means average delay. Uh, these bars here uh, show in effect the, uh, the error bars, so the variability around the average, uh, the average um, behavior. Uh, again, now what you see is that the, the blue here, which was doing very well for throughput, does very, very well for delay. Uh, and when I look at the max delay, again, the blue which is the recoding with RLNC does extremely well, uh, whereas uh, uh, ARQ or end-to-end -end coding don't do so well at all. Uh, these are just uh, more results of this type. Uh, this is comparing with hop-by-hop -hop, um, uh, ARQ, so repeating lost packets hop-by-hop. -hop. So in a hop-by-hop -hop ARQ, what happened is if this, uh, if this node didn't receive a packet, rather than asking end-to-end -end, in an end-to-end -end system, the receiver node would go all the way back to the sender node and ask for the packet. Uh, in hop-by-hop -hop ARQ, you would ask this previous node, or if, oops, or if this node failed to get a packet, it would ask that node. So it would be far less wasteful in resources because um, in end-to-end -end ARQ, like in uh, TCP IP, if this, node uh, loses a packet just at the last link, then it would make the request of re retransmission all the way from the center, and that would generate another transmission here, another transmission here, another transmission there, whereas really it only needed one more transmission rather than three transmissions across the network. Uh, again, here the blue is the uh, random new network coding with mixing at intermediate nodes, and what you see is um, Again, much better behavior. Now, of course, uh, the ARQ is still better than just end-to-end -end coding, uh, but uh, as you see, the the uh, um, the RLNC is the best of all of them. I should point out that if you have uh, if you have um, 
a hop by hop uh, ARQ, it's it's not bad. Okay, um, it, it's it's not so bad. Uh, it's still not as good as random coding. It's still much better than, of course, end to end coding. Um, but uh, but the end to end coding is uh, significantly superior to all the other systems and consistently so um, in throughput, average delay, and max delay. Where again, max delay is considering this in order of max delay. All right. Uh, so let's look some more at uh, at this evolution. Uh, one of the aspects of the evolution, as I mentioned, is sort of this heterogeneity here uh, in the, in the uh, in the access uh, between a user's equipment and different networks. Uh, right now, uh, my access, by and large, with my phone uh, is really is really manual. Um, I may switch off my my access to to my base station, I may have to uh, manually set my preferences for different apps where I tell them to only work if Wi-Fi is on, or I may tell them to use Wi-Fi, it's available, but not use Wi-Fi otherwise. And by the way, I wanted to call your attention to a, a piece of news that happened, I believe, last week, um, but I think you may have seen that the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, has now uh, made an agreement for Wi-Fi roaming, uh, one of the large, um, this incentives to using Wi-Fi was that one often has to uh, uh, sign in. You know, there's, there's a fairly onerous, clunky interaction between the user and the network. Uh, but if you have Wi-Fi roaming, which already happens for some uh, for some um, uh, service providers, uh, I know it's more common in, in Europe. Uh, certainly, free in France uh, did it very early on, but you have companies doing that also here uh, in the U.S. where um, they use uh, available Wi-Fi resources from the customers uh, to provide service uh, to their customers who are roaming. Um, then I think that that's something that um, uh, that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, but right now, that that's being done in a um, in a in a manual way. So what I just described would allow you to to do it. Um, uh, in an automatic way, where you just be automatically connected, and you would automatically just be, you would automatically just access the networks uh, in the most natural, blended fashion, according to whatever is available in terms of resources. And of course, um, the the approach I just showed to you can also use costs. So if you want to use uh, the cellular network less because it's more costly. Then you can wait. Uh, you can wait how much you you place on each of these networks. Okay, let me move on here to to this next step, uh, which is this this uh, cloud at the edge. Uh, this is what we sometimes call the fog because it's a cloud, but it's very close to the edge, very close to the ground. Um, and this really plays on something which uh, I mentioned briefly earlier in this lecture, uh, which is this sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, approach uh, to using a storage. Using the, the storage, this is my, uh, this is my little, uh, uh, icon uh, for the for the storage, uh, using the storage that's available in uh, in uh, user equipment. So, for instance, uh, my phone has some storage, uh, and the question is, you know, how can I, I go ahead uh, and use that storage in a way which which works with um, with other other parts of the system? Um, so, here's another example where you can use random in network coding. So, uh, we call this sometimes the uh, the, the melting iceberg. Um, so what, what am I showing you here? So this is the amount of storage uh, that's required uh, in each piece of equipment, so say in each phone. This is the amount of traffic that's required uh, in, uh, in terms of um, phones or user equipment, user devices uh, exchanging. And reliability here is the probability that the data uh, is available. So what's happening here is that people are walking in and out of this cloud. See this cloud here, this person just walked in, this person walks out. And the question is locally, can I maintain my data? Is the data survivable with this sort of highly mobile uh, environment? Now, of course, if everybody walks out, there's going to be no data and I'm going to have to then go back somewhere to the core and reacquire that data or uh, use the local cache to reacquire either all or part of that data. 
but basically here what we're showing is keeping the number of, of uh, users in the in the fog constant, but allowing movement of those users in and out. So as users come in, they get updated with some amount of traffic. Um, and as users go, that go out, uh, they are replaced by new users. So it's a sort of a constant in and out. And what you can see here is that if I have no coding, very quickly the system falls apart. Uh, it's because of the fact that you know a particular piece of, of data uh, even though it may live in several users' uh, memory, uh, is more likely if it's uncoded to get lost because maybe it was being stored by two or three people, but those happen to be the two or three people who moved out of the area. And so when new people come in, that data is lost. With end-to-end -end coding, like a read Solomon code, which is what's shown here, or or um, or say a, a fountain code, they, there is there is some better performance, but it does eventually die. Uh, if you use an RLNC where you're constantly recoding the, uh, the videos you're playing, uh, you actually, uh, it actually basically never dies. It does die eventually, uh, but it dies on the order of, uh, you know, glacial periods uh, to, to continue, the, to continue the, the, the iceberg analogy. So really you're looking at years and years, which of course is not the type of um, perennity that you're expecting uh, from these fog systems. Okay. Um, one of the other aspects that I just want to touch upon briefly is the security aspect. Um, one of the concerns that people naturally have with these um, with these systems that are um, that are heterogeneous uh, is the security. And you know, this has been very much in the news lately, as as you recall. Uh, because some countries object to having uh, some equipment providers uh, participate in the 5G network, uh, but also because of other security issues uh, that may be popping up. There was some news from Cisco and so on about some security issues. Uh, and certainly, you know, if we're talking about disconnecting to, say, the, uh, the Wi-Fi routers of just people on the street, uh, you know, those routers will be provided by all kinds of different vendors uh, and also set up by all kinds of, uh, of different operators, often just, you know, individuals. So should I be worried about sending my data? Uh, maybe there's a backdoor, maybe there's some malware, uh, whatever they may be, there is, there, there, it seems like it would be risky. Now, certainly um, beyond traditional encryption, uh, if I place my data as is, uh, and I'm worried about having a backdoor on a node, then I should be worried. That's to say, if I don't code uh, and say I give packet one uh, to uh, the Wi-Fi router and packet two to the base station, if either the router or the base station uh, is malicious, maybe they will have access to packet one or access to packet two, and therefore they will have access maybe only to part of my data, but that's not good enough. When I code, actually, uh, it means that uh, um, that's no longer the case. The Wi-Fi router is just going to have access to a coded version of my data, and the, the, uh, the base station is also going to have access to a coded version of my data. And I, Recall that I mentioned that data is algebraic, and I'm using the algebraic um, characterization of that data. So uh, suppose that packet one, for the sake of argument, is a number, let's say five, and packet two is another number, let's say 10. Um, if I tell you that their sum is 15, um, you actually don't know what packet one or packet two were. Maybe one of them was zero and the other one was 15. Uh, maybe one was minus five and the other one was 20. It could be anything. So I'm really not allowing you any information, but just showing you uh, sums of linear combinations of the data. That's actually the, um, uh, the underlying principle behind something called the McLeastar crypto systems. Uh, some of you may know it more in the context of COPA codes. Um, and uh, Again, as many of you know, because this has been very much in the news, uh, there's a big, of, there's quite a bit of interest lately in uh, systems such as post-quantum uh, crypto systems, which would be um, secure even if quantum computing becomes uh, uh, becomes available. And actually, McLeese crypto systems uh, were shown by one of my colleagues at MIT, Peter Short, to be uh, quantum safe. 
post from that a few years ago. So this actually is uh, an instance of the Mercury's crypto system, which forms the basis for what we call post-quantum crypto. So it's actually uh, very secure. I just want to give you an example of where this is being used. I mentioned B2X earlier in the presentation because it's, uh, it's an application that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, so actually, this is right now uh, in a pilot program uh, in New York City um, for, um, uh, for the next generation of um, safety equipment in cars. So, um, you know, also being uh, being deployed. Okay, let's go back to this evolution of error correcting codes. I talked about the network, uh, but all of these codes that I keep telling you are point to point, by and large, except for the except for the rate list codes, by and large, were not actually being developed to be working over packets. They actually were being developed to work within a packet. So I'm taking out here all the network coding aspects and all the things that are meant to work at higher layers. And let me go just to, um, what's happening at the lower layers. Uh, I mentioned 3GPP, a lot of their work, actually most of their work is really concerned with what we call the phi layer, the physical layer, what's happening at the lower layers. And in those layers, uh, I showed you this evolution of, of codes. Uh, I'm now putting low density parity check codes, LDPCs in their rightful place in the 1960s uh, rather than the 90s. Um, and uh, what I have here is, uh, I've added two light colored uh, points. And what I'm and adding these light colored points is because um, these, are, these are codes uh, that have been known in theory uh, for a long, long time to be capacity achieving, okay? So these are the codes here are not necessarily capacity achieving or they've been shown to be capacity achieving uh, empirically mostly, except for polar codes, which are known to be capacity achieving but actually in order to be deployed, have to be changed quite a bit um, with having um, the addition of some CRCs, cyclic redundancy checks and uh, different, um, different implementation than the one that was originally uh, proposed by my colleague and friend, um, um, Erdogan Arakan, uh, who actually also shared the same uh, doctoral advisor, Bob Gallagher, the inventor of LDPCs. So these random codes have been around for a while. These random linear codes here are similar in spirit to what I showed you before, but there's no recoding. Uh, it's just a random linear end-to-end -end code. Uh, now, these codes have uh, up until now really been considered as just being theoretical constructs, useful for proofs. Uh, but not useful for implementation. And so the reason for that, I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit, but what it, uh, it has led to is a co-design of codes and decoders. Uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, inefficiencies and delays due to something we call interleaving, which is the mixing up at the lower layers, uh, lower communication layer and the physical layer uh, in order to allow uh, in order to allow a certain types of a statistical um, behavior of the resultant channel to match the design of the code. So these codes all match to certain designs of channels, which are all independent. Uh, real channels are not independent, but in order to make them look independent, you mix them up. And with that, you add a huge amount of delay. As a matter of fact, you multiply the delay by a matter of about a hundred or so. And this is what I mean by the interleaving. Uh, this is before interleaving. This is what real channels look like. Uh, and they're interleaved over a large, uh, over uh, very um, uh, large intervals uh, in order to, to make them look like they're independent. Um, so the, the co-design here um, is really due to, um, is really due, as I mentioned, to the fact that these were always considered up until now to be too complex to decode. Uh, the reason it would be considered too complex to decode is because uh, people were looking in particular at long codes. But if you're looking at, um, uh, at shorter codes, um, then one of the things that happens is the following. Um, here what I have is, uh, is uh, capacity, so the uh, utmost 
out of bound of what's possible um, with an arbitrary long code. If my code length, which is given here in the abscissa, is, is shorter than that, so I'm looking here at code lengths of around 100 or so, um, I can't reach that. Uh, this is a converse. Uh, these are some achievable bounds that are known in the literature. Um, this is actually available on GitHub. If you look, this is my colleague, Yuri Kunyansky at MIT has put together this on GitHub. And it basically means that, you know, if you're gonna have a shorter code, you can't do any better than this. But actually, uh, these bounds are not uh, up until now achievable. They're just theoretical bounds. People don't know how to encode and decode. If you look at what traditional used codes look like, uh, they don't look anything like this. You actually don't have that many code lengths available. Uh, and you don't have that many rates available. Now, why do I want short code lengths? I want short code lengths because of this low delay. If I'm going to have codes of thousands and thousands of bits, uh, which is what uh, LDPCs generally have, uh, for instance, this is what's in the 5G standard right now, um, then you know I'm going to have a long delay. And if on top of that, I'm interleaving uh, over say 100 block, uh, um, what we call the blocks, so block, yeah, blur here stands for block, uh, block error rate uh, for a code, then we're looking at basically having delays that are like a thousand times a hundred, these huge delays really do because of the physical layer. Um, so what I'd like to do here is just show you something uh, about these uh, Reed-Muller codes uh, which are classical codes, you see that you don't have them available at many locations. Uh, these points, uh, blue means low probability of error, uh, red means higher probability of error. Um, and um, the code constructions that we have um, are, are very limited, uh, and the theory doesn't look anywhere like this, right? This is the theory, this is the practice, these are the uh, CRC aided, that's what CA stands for uh, codes that I mentioned that are out there right now. So let me go look at uh, a completely different approach, uh, which we just came out with in the last couple of years, um, along with Maynooth University, Ken Duffy is there, which is, uh, let me look at decoding different kinds of codes, and this fits into the heterogeneity picture, uh, because what we're looking at is uh, different codes in, uh, in different, um, uh, in, in this in this setting. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to guess the noise. And the, um, the heterogeneity here is that you do have different codes. For instance, uh, you do have different codes available uh, even for the same type of link, say in, in the 5G, 3G, BP uh, standardization. What I do here is because uh, I want high code rates, so I want this R, which is the code rate to be high, this is large. I don't want to be trying to decode over the code. I want to be able to decode over the noise. Uh, and um, I'll just leave you quickly with, uh, because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, because um, I have to leave at around uh, 10. Uh, I have, I'm afraid, another uh, uh, another commitment. Um, this I want to leave you with. This is um, um, polar codes. So here we're just, in, and this is, uh, CASCL uh, with um, a list size of 16. Um, this is uh, according to a um, uh, to a decoding algorithm uh, which was invented by Tal and by Lavardi, uh, who was licensed from UCSD uh, by Samsung. Uh, the chips that are out there, I uh, say the, the Huawei chips, usually have a length which is much shorter, say eight or so, so the performance wouldn't be as good. This is the length of the of the list, which is an intermediate step in the decoding. This is not to do with the, the length of the code. Uh, and uh, this is what we're able to obtain uh, using uh, our decoding on guessing the noise. Um, this is uh, what we're able to obtain uh, actually with a random code. <laughs> so interestingly enough, uh, the random code does at least as well as the, as the polar code. Uh, and the random code is actually um, optimal. Um, in some cases, by the way, even without soft information, which is information uh, in the chip about some of the characteristics of the reception, uh, even without soft information, uh, with our approach here, this guessing noise approach, we call it ga grand, guessing random additive noise decoding, uh, we're able to, to do better in some cases than even with the soft approach. 
Um, and of course, our our guessing with with soft information is is optimum is quite better than this is the the state of the art right now. Um, so with that, I just wanted to mention that we have uh, that you you can use these random codes and. Unlike what I showed you here, where you had very few choices with traditional codes, including polar codes, uh, you know, the world is just your oyster. You have all the choices you want. So with a random code, you have no constraint on rate. You have no constraint on code length. Again, here, remember, blue shows lower probability there. Red shows higher probability there. Mm -hmm. So all of these points now are, are achievable uh, and they're best they're better than the known theoretical up until now uh, unachievable bounds. So these are achievable uh, they're better than the known theory up until now. Okay so 5G I hope uh, I uh, showed you why there is this uh, issue with heterogeneity, heterogeneity in links, also heterogeneity within a link on the technologies, particularly coding technologies. Um, and I hope I also showed you that randomness is a feature to be exploited. Uh, we explore, exploit randomness in our LMC in order to create our coding. And we exploit the randomness of the, uh, of the uh, noise in grand uh, in order to enable our decoding. And we also exploit the randomness of our LCs uh, because grand allows uh, random linear codes, which are superior to any or short codes are superior to any of the existing codes, provably so. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. I don't know if everybody's muted. Any of you have questions? Okay. Oh, we can only write, we're muted. Okay, so if anybody wishes to write a question, please go ahead. Thank you, Larry. So the question is, does your LNC have any drawbacks in the conventional one? Um, so the conventional end-to-end -end codes, like I said, like the, 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 the fountain codes uh, are, are in effect a, a very rude. So the, answer, the short answer is no. Uh, they're much more efficient. Uh, random linear work codes, as I showed you in that picture, are much more efficient. Uh, provide, you can always use them like a traditional end-to-end -end rateless code. So you, you can use them that way, um, but you can, you know, they're tunable, so they're, they're better. Uh, so no, there are no drawbacks. They go very quickly. Uh, what are the 5G electronics required for RNC? So RNC uh, works very, um, very easily. It's highly parallelizable, um, so it doesn't require specific electronics. Um, for grand, uh, the, the electronics are also not difficult. We're actually today, it's a lot of things happening today. It's sort of bizarre. Today we are um, um, taping out a grand chip uh, for the second part. So um, we're taping out a grand chip with just uh, hard information right now. So for Ireland, see, it's, it's very, very easy. Um, um, design and actually let me right here but if you want to try it I and see I would try I would really urge you to go and check out uh, Kodo uh, from the company Steinwolf. Um, I don't know if I can I'd like to I'm going to send it to everybody so if you're interested in RLNC go and check out Steinwolf. Uh, so Kodo is is the Steinwolf um, uh, software 
uh, for RNC, and you'll see it's very efficient. Uh, and as I said, it's it's being used right now. Uh, so the, the electronics are not uh, difficult. Um, okay, so I have a comment. Uh, I hope that answers the question uh, from Kenrick and from uh, Talim. Talim, um, there's now a question from Irwin. Uh, thank you, Chose from uh, Australia. Ugly mobile phone antennas. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so um, the ugly mobile phone antennas and video to, to hide them in Memphis. Uh, so actually, we have right now with uh, MIT a 5G project with, uh, with a company named uh, Ubiware uh, in Portugal that's uh, looking at doing um, uh, 5G microstations in effect uh, in, in lampposts uh, with storage and so on. So um, I don't know that the I don't know that the um, the motivation was particular about there being ugly or not. So I don't know that it was uh, that it was a, a let's say a, a motivation around the aesthetics. Um, but certainly, you know, it is it is a piece of uh, of uh, public furniture, uh, which is uh, uh, which you know it's it's a piece of public infrastructure, um, and it also already has electricity running to it because of course you, you have you have lamps, uh, so it's it's a very useful piece of uh, public furniture and infrastructure. Uh, but you know, stay tuned uh, for some of that uh, uh, deployment. I don't know if there are any other questions. All right, so there's another question from uh, Henry Kenrick. Uh, do I think that people will totally shift to RLNC? Um, I'm biased. Let me start by saying that I'm biased. Uh, I think the answer is yes, uh, because as you go from point to point, connections to networks. And I don't think anybody is thinking that we're moving away from a network world. Then you want a network code. And that's the only uh, available uh, network code. So, uh, and it's provably optimum. So uh, I believe so, but of course, as one of the inventors, I'm, I'm very, very biased. So uh, I'll, I'll admit to that. But, you know, I was, I was very uh, excited to, to share with you guys the, the news that came out this morning uh, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to look at the, the Barracuda. Um, uh, maybe I'll just, I'll just share it with you right now. Uh, the, if I'll just share it with you in the chat, if I may. Uh, So you can you can look at that. Oh, I'm having trouble. Let me actually stop sharing. And uh, for whatever reason, it's not. But you know, you can look at the Barracuda and the Steinwolf um, uh, announcement today. It's in it's a press release from both of them. So if you want, you can look at that and, and you can see how it's being used. And you can see also why I think it will be used everywhere. All right. So thank you guys uh, for attending. Um, and um, enjoy the, the rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Okay, bedtime for Irwin, yes. <laughs> See you guys.